Well, the day had arrived for me to embark on my first job. So, on Tuesday the 4th of April 1961, there had been an Easter bank holiday on Monday the 3rd, I duly reported to the running foreman's office, which was situated at the foot of the concrete steps that led down from Farnham Road. I had been here before, trying to sneak under the running foreman's radar to get a look at the locomotives in the shed, but this time I was here for real. I had a brief interview with the shed master, Mr Stobbold, and was then taken to the cleaner's cabin and introduced to Reg Fone, who was in charge of the engine cleaners. Health and safety issues were then explained, and I was then taken to the stores to collect my uniform which consisted of two pairs of trousers, which could be bib and brace, two lightweight jackets, a black serge jacket and a shiny topped hat. This was emblazoned with a green enamel British Railways badge. Other paraphernalia included the 1950 rule book, with a list of amendments which I had to carefully paste into the book. I was then introduced to the other cleaners, and we were then given instructions on what locomotives we were going to clean. Before any work could be carried out, the locomotive had to display a red not to be moved board and this was attached to the locomotive by the person in charge and this could only be removed by that same person when the work had been completed. Every part of the outside of the locomotive had to be cleaned and this would involve climbing onto the framing of the locomotive, brandishing several cloths termed brownons, which were white cloths not dissimilar to household cleaning cloths that had been washed several times. These were doused in a paraffin and oil mixture which had been mixed in a bucket and then wiped across the paintwork of the boiler, framing and tender. The coupling rods and valve gear, motion, were also cleaned in this way and sometimes if the locomotive was of the design where the motion was under the boiler, the rods could only be accessed from underneath by climbing up from the pit below. The excess oily mixture was then wiped off with successive cloths that some of the mixture would always end up running down your arms, creating a tide mark. The first locomotive I helped to clean on my first day was V-Class Schools 30909 St Paul's, one of three schools locomotives assigned to Guildford, their paintwork being a glorious Brunswick green. I thoroughly enjoyed my first day at work and went home elated. After all, here I was performing a job which I was passionate about and I was going to get paid for it. Shift work was also a necessity, and a small roster was maintained by Reg Fone. The shifts consisted of 8am to 4pm, and a 2pm to 10pm. It was also expected that you would spend some of the time working as an office boy in the running foreman's office. This would involve assisting the non-clerical timekeepers, who at that time were Percy Engel, Len Redding, Charlie Davey, and Bert Mitchell, whose brother Frank was the labourer ash loader. Paydays were on a Thursday, although you had to work a week in advance, and you collected your pay at the pay table situated at the country end of Platform 2, next to the buffet. My take-home pay was only about £3, 2 shillings and sixpence, so at first I was reluctant to join the Aslef Union. One day I was approached by a fellow cleaner, who was senior to me, and asked if I would like to work with him the following Saturday, as there was vacancy. As I was courting at the time, and on a 2pm to 10pm shift, and he was on an 8am to 4pm shift, I jumped at the chance. On the Saturday morning, Reg Fone approached us, and as mentioned, as he was senior to me, Reg asked him, Do you want to clean engines or scrub the office floors? Well, you can guess what he said. I had been stitched up a tree. Off I had to go and scrub the brown linoleum off not only the running foreman's office floors, but also the ambulance room, the stores office and the foreman fitters office floors, scrubbing brush, tar soap and on your hands and knees for hours. It was a dirty trick to play and I never trusted him again. Sometimes it became necessary to be the office boy within the running foreman's office. This job didn't seem too bad at first. After all, you remained fairly clean, although there were drawbacks. One of these was to go to the canteen situated at the top of the steps adjacent to Farnham Road, and write down the lunch menu of the day. The menu was then presented to the office staff, 
situated in the main building two floors up. This meant going down the concrete steps and then climbing two sets of wooden stairs to reach the office. I had absolutely no experience whatsoever being a waiter, so carrying several plates of lunches separated by metal rings was completely alien to me, especially when trying to balance the whole lot whilst negotiating the stairs. Gravy would spill from one plate to another and some of this would end up in some of the puddings. The office staff in 1961 were as follows. George Stovall, Shedmaster. Mr Stovall had a terrible stutter and because of this he'd have tremendous difficulty in deciphering what he wanted to order. He retired in 1962 and John Butt took office for a couple of years and then Arthur Coe took his place. Archie Martin, Chief Clerk. Mr Martin had a massive desk and correspondence would be piled up all over the place. When looking for an item he'd utter, it's here somewhere, as he tossed various papers up in the air as he searched. John Phoebe, list clerk. John would make out all of the rosters and the daily alteration sheet. Other office staff were Arthur Herbert, who would sometimes perform the list clerk's job, and Stan Wright, who was in charge of pay bills. Other staff that sometimes ordered lunches in the running former's office were Fred Price, Harry Harvey, Frank Chudley, Bill Maynard and Jack Clements, although this was only on rare occasions as he would normally bring sandwiches, which he'd ritually cut up into tiny pieces with a small penknife, probably because he wore false teeth top and bottom. In the stores office, Eric Windsor. In the fitters office, Ted Blake. As mentioned in the Potted History chapter, a seniority-based link structure existed at Guildford Motor Power Depot, and there were in excess of 100 drivers and 80 firemen there when I started work. Each link had 12 pairs of men, the best work, mainly passenger work, being rostered at number one link. Other work was shared out and there was also a dual link where the drivers worked electric traction as well as steam and covered other depots in the area such as Effingham Junction, Guildford, Ascot, Farnham and Woking. The other links covered holiday relief, ballast working, mixed freight turns and yard shunting duties. Further work and any alterations were posted on the daily alteration sheet and some of the men would sometimes have to be called out at short notice using the call out system. As the office boy, you might have to deliver several call notes to addresses and you'd be expected to receive an answer from the person concerned as to whether they would accept the change of their next signing on time or not. Variably, the person you were calling on had worked the night before and would be asleep when you called. So you can imagine what sort of an answer you were about to get if the signing on time or turn of duty wasn't to their liking. Sometimes I just used to push the call note through the letterbox and just hope they wouldn't refuse the job. Other men that worked at Guildford MPD at the time were the table gang drivers consisting of Jim Parker, Senior, Horace Cummins, Joe Dadson, Percy Smallbones, Alfie Springle and Arthur Vodden. plus the table gang operators, Mr Hiscock, Bill Smith and Fred Worsfold. On a three shift system, they shared the other half of the cleaners prefabricated hut adjacent to the turntable. Steam raisers Tex Tucker, Jack Cock Robbins and Claude Johns accompanied them. The coaling gang consisted of Steve Burke, Steve Bishop and Willie Hunt and they resided in a separate hut next to the coal stage. The store staff consisted of Eric Windsor, Les Joy, Arthur Legg and Archie Lampard and their office was directly below the Shedmaster's office. The boilersmiths and fitters had separate accommodation within the locomotive shed. Apart from the main canteen, there was a small wooden structured mobile canteen which was situated on the mail dock near Guildford Station's number 2 platform. 
this was quite a haunt for us cleaners and I remember that the lady who ran it made some really nice homemade oat cakes which was a welcome change from the bread and cheese sandwiches I usually took to work. Another job given to the late turn office boy on a Wednesday evening was to take the pay bills to Alton. These were placed in a canvas dispatch bag, the flap being tied down the string with a knot held in place by sealing wax. You would then catch the Guildford to Aldershot train, changing there for the Alton train. Once you'd arrived at Alton, you then handed the dispatch bag to the guard on the Alton to Eastleigh train, who would then ensure that it arrived at the Pables department at Eastleigh. It was quite a journey, and it was on some of these occasions that I would ask if I could ride in the cab with the driver of the electric unit. I remember once riding in the cab with driver Alfie Lake, who I think was based at Woking. He called the Alton line the jungle, and I could see why, as I was amazed how dark the line was at night, as there were no headlights on trains in those days. On another occasion, I rode in the cab with the driver, and he let me drive the unit from Ash to Aldershot. I was only 15, and holding the power controller down for long periods was too much for me, and I accidentally released it. I didn't realise that the control had to go to the off position before the dead man could be released, and we nearly became gapped between the conductor rails on the approach to Aldershot station. Luckily, the driver jumped across and saved the situation. Another office boy duty was to collect the notices that were issued to drivers. This was usually performed on the Thursday late shift and would involve wheeling a sack barrow across the foot crossing, station side of Farnham Road Bridge, to the station parcels office situated on platform two, by the steps near platform one down bay. The late turn non-clerical timekeeper would also accompany you. The publications would be in stacks and were quite heavy and once they had been wheeled back to the office they were then sorted in neat piles and placed in each driver's pigeonhole. All of the driver's work was recorded on the driver's daily return ticket. The fireman was also included and once completed at the end of the shift were placed in a large box in the running foreman's office. It would then be the office boy's task to sort them all out in alphabetical order for the pay clerk and this became an easy way for me to recognise everyone that I've been working with in the future and help put names to faces. After a couple of months it was necessary to purchase a new push bike so I asked my dad if he would lend me the money and I'd pay him back a pound a week. This was duly agreed and he accompanied me to Jackson Cycles which was situated at the bottom of Portsmouth Road and chose a Claude Butler racing bike and its price then was £26. It was a cracking bike and one evening on my way home I called into the ship inn at Pitch Place to get a bottle of double diamond ale for Joe Davies who resided at Tangley Place Farm. I wasn't in there a couple of minutes and when I came out my treasured Claude Butler had disappeared. Although I'd insured the bike when I purchased it I was heartbroken to find that it had been stolen. About a month passed and I, just as I was about to receive my insurance claim I had a phone call from the police that my bike had been recovered at Mitchett Army Camp and I could make provisions to collect it. Obviously a soldier had decided to borrow it, get back to barracks before he was listed as AWOL. I was itching to have a ride on the footplate of a locomotive and my first actual trip out onto the main line was on M7 class drum and tank 30378. The fireman was Ted Wells and the trip was all over in a few minutes as it was a light locomotive from the depot to Guildford Station for the 6.5pm Guildford to Horsham service. There were three M7 class drum and tanks belonging to Guildford Motor Power Depot at the time I started work. The numbers were 30132, 30246 and 30378. However, my next trip out was far more memorable and took place on a Saturday afternoon when I was off duty. I'd been asked by Fireman Jim Granger if I'd like to go with him on a trip to Reading and back. I couldn't resist the opportunity and met Jim at Guildford Up Yard on a Saturday afternoon. The trip involved working the 3.24pm freight from Guildford Up Yard to Reading Yard and then working the 7.24pm freight back to Guildford Up Yard. The locomotive on the turn was a Q1 class and the driver was Bill Phillips. 
I met Jim in Guildford Up Yard just before starting time and away we went, climbing the severe gradient out of Guildford Up Pink Hill with Jim demonstrating how to fire the locomotive and replenishing the boiler with water by working the injectors. After a while, Jim let me perform these duties. I was in my element. When we arrived at Reading, we took the locomotive into Reading Southern Shed and took water, turned the engine on the turntable and made the fire up for the return journey. Jim and Bill then invited me to join them for a drink at the Rising Sun public house just outside Reading Southern Station. I remember having a pint of beer. Hey, I was only 15 and a half years old. The return trip was equally as thrilling and I got off the locomotive at Guildford Up Yard feeling elated. I thank them both for giving me an insight into what would be expected of me when I became a fireman. As the months towards my 16th birthday went by, several other lads started work as engine cleaners. Ian Coles, Alan Johns, Sid Ford and the Sharman twins, and I soon moved up the ranks in seniority. It was customary to offer the senior cleaner a job within the boilersmith shop, and as Bill Moore, who had previously performed the job, had been promoted to fast cleaner, the position was offered to me. One of the jobs involved clambering into the fireboxes of locomotives. Their fires had been thrown out and the fireboxes had cooled down considerably, I hasten to add. The only protection you were given was a cotton fibre face mask, and you then crawled inside the firebox, feet first, via the firehole door. Once inside, you were then passed a small shovel and hand brush, plus a small metal bar that resembled a tyre lever. You would then climb onto the brick arch, clean any clinker away from the tube plate, and clear away the ash that had accumulated on top of the brick arch. All the fire bars then had to be rigorously shaken back and forth with the metal lever to remove any bits of clinker that were trapped between them. The ash and clinker etc was then passed out to the boilersmith, Alfie Bath in most cases, via the firehole door utilising a small shovel. On average, two or three locomotives fireboxes were cleaned in this way every day. Once I even had the honour of climbing into the firebox of B4 class 30089 which even though I was only a small lad, was a bit of a tight squeeze. It was whilst I was working in the boilersmith shop that I met Pat Kinsella. I was keen to learn the fireman's trade and asked him if I could help him with his preparation duties. He readily agreed and as he was in the process of filling the sandboxes on his locomotive, I gave him a hand. As I was carrying the two laden sand buckets from the sand furnace back to the locomotive, I accidentally trod on a wooden board which had a rusty nail sticking out of it. The nail penetrated my boot and went into my left foot, at which point I let forth a yelp and quickly dropped the sand buckets. I tried to lift my foot up off the board, but as I did so, the board lifted as well. The only way I could move was to tread on the board with my right foot to hold it down and then gingerly lift my left foot away from the board. Needless to say, I had to visit the Surrey County Hospital in Farnham Road to have an anti-tetanus injection and afterwards had to ride my bike back home to Warbleston, which proved quite painful and from then on became very wary of wooden boards laying around the shed. As mentioned, when I first joined, I was issued with a green British Railways cap badge but it became the fad to change the design of these and have a small locomotive badge affixed to the top. This was no mean feat and it soon became apparent that to get the badge sparkling clean it would be necessary to chip all of the green enamel from the badge and to dip it into a bath of sulfuric acid which was kept in a covered sink around the back of the old shed. This was an extremely dangerous practice but it had the desired effect. I'm sure there was a sign nearby warning all of the dangers but boys will be boys. The locomotive badge would then have to be soldered onto the top there was always someone that knew someone within the shed that could perform this task and this was done for a couple of shillings. Whilst working in the boilersmith shop I was earning twice as much as a cleaner as I was now on labourer's rate of pay. Stupidly I didn't save my money then and bought all sorts of expensive things that I didn't really need. Balkan Sobrani tobacco and a falcon pipe, a Ronson gas lighter and a leather cigarette case I wasn't even old enough to smoke. 
Never mind, I'll be 16 in a few weeks' time. I'm really looking forward to my firing apprenticeship.